Hey guys, Richard from Digital Foundry here. We wanted to build a budget gaming PC for around a £300, $400 price point that could, in theory at least, offer multi-platform gaming performance on a par with Sony's PlayStation 4. It's a tough challenge to be sure, but as you can see from this comparison of Techland's Dying Light, we get pretty damn close. So what parts are we using? Well, at the heart of the system is the Pentium G3258 running at 4.2GHz, a clear 1GHz boost over its standard clock speed. We're running at 1.2 volts here on the standard Intel cooler. Temps are in the 60 to 70 degrees Celsius range. GPU wise we're using the Nvidia GTX 750Ti with a 200 MHz boost to the core clock and an extra 400 MHz to the RAM. We're overclocking here using MSI Afterburner by the way. If you're wondering why we aren't using an AMD card, the truth is that their driver isn't quite as optimised as Nvidia's, leading to some poor performance drops on lower end CPUs, which is exactly what we're using here. Check out the text below the video for a link to some testing to illustrate the issue. The motherboard we're using is an ultra cheap NSI H81 MP33. It's a very basic board, but one that does support rudimentary overclocking. In terms of memory, we managed to get hold of some Kingston Hyper Savage 2400 MHz RAM on sale for around £40, but in truth, any DDR3 from 1333 MHz upwards would do fine. The MSI board has RAM speed limitations anyway, and the key here is quantity. You need at least 8GB to run the latest games. And here we are running them. We've tried to match the visual look of the PS4 versions to PC settings. Not always possible, but in the case of Metro Last Light here, we've got a pretty decent lock and the frame rate to match. Occasionally you'll find that the console versions have benefited from additional optimization. So looking at Tomb Raider Definitive Edition here, compared to the original version running on PC, it's actually using a second generation version of the Tress FX hair rendering technology. Now you can use a similar effect on the PC using the first gen iteration, but not without crippling frame rate, especially on close-ups. We've opted to get a close match in terms of overall quality settings, but we really wanted to hit a locked 60 FPS. To do that we prefer to turn TressFX off, but the beauty of the PC is that it's the platform where you can define the experience. So you could, for example, instigate a 30fps lock and activate a whole bunch of features that aren't present on the uh, PS4 version, for example tessellation. So far so good then, somehow an overclocked dual core Pentium is able to run some pretty complex games and keep pace with the PlayStation 4. Across the range of games we tested, it did a far better job than we expected, but cracks do begin to show the more titles you play. So here's Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes. On the face of it, our budget PC keeps pace admirably as we watch the visually demanding cinematic, but as soon as we move into more CPU intensive gameplay, the G3258 starts to lose frames, causing unwanted judder. As we move into a more action orientated sequence, the frame rate drops become even more pronounced. At this point we swapped in our Core i3-4130, a 3.4GHz dual-core chip with one crucial advantage over the Pentium, hyper-threading. Despite the 800MHz deficit in raw clock speed, the fact that four threads are available makes all the difference. In Metal Gear you can see that the performance drops are completely gone, giving us parity with the PS4 game running on equivalent quality settings. The improvements continue across other more modern games, and often they're radical. Check out Rise, Son of Rome, here compared between the i3 and the G3258 along with the original Xbox One version. We're running the PC version here at 1080p, but using the in-game downscaler to run at 90% resolution, still a touch higher than the Xbox One's 900p. As you can see, performance is subject to disastrous drops on the Pentium, and while the i3 isn't completely unaffected, it's clearly a night and day difference. Almost as bad is Assassin's Creed Unity, which we're running here at 900p to match the console versions. Performance drops like a stone on the Pentium, while the i3, running at 800MHz less remember, is hitting 30fps pretty consistently, although the PC version is subject to the odd split second lockup. So, to enforce the 30fps cap similar to the console versions, we're using Nvidia's half-rate adaptive VSync option, found in the GPU control panel. This locks frame rates to 30fps, just like console, for a more consistent experience, introducing screen tear only if frame rates drop beneath the 30fps target. It's a really useful tool, and you can see it again in operation here in Far Cry 4 where we've locked to 30fps once more. We could actually run the game at 1080p 30 with full ultra settings engaged. You'll see the occasional bit of stutter, and that's something you'll need to fix yourself via an hack. it's not to do with the Pentium here. 
Perhaps the biggest problem here is that the game refuses to boot on the G3258 requiring a third party hack to make it work, and after that everything's fine. But there's no such problems on the i3 here, signalling that game developers really don't expect top end games to be running on pure dual core CPUs anymore, no matter how fast they're running. We're back to targeting 60 FPS in our next test, one of the most demanding, in CPU terms at least, campaign levels from Battlefield 4. This game runs at 900p on the PS4 and we're using a 1080p output with an 85% scaling effect to get something close to the same resolution on our PC setup. Once again we see that the G3258 has real trouble sustaining the desired frame rate here, and there are even occasional frame time spikes to 50 milliseconds indicating noticeable stutter. Finally, Let's round off with another game that initially failed to boot with the G3258, Sledgehammer's Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. The game was subsequently patched to support dual core processors, albeit with a warning when you boot the game. At 4.2GHz the G3258 wobbles a bit, but overall performance in this demanding stage is still creditable, even beating PS4 in a couple of areas, though struggling in others, especially compared to the i3. So, overall, interesting results. A cheap PC can match PS4 performance in many games, at least for now. The GTX 750 Ti acquits itself admirably in delivering a PS4 level of GPU performance, and obviously there's an upgrade path available there for much higher levels of performance if you want it. But it's in the CPU where you really have to think carefully. Do you take the budget price point of the G3258 to make your build as cheap as possible, or do you spend more on an i3 for increased stability, compatibility and performance? Well, personally we'd take the i3, or even consider choosing an older Socket 1155 motherboard and buying a second-hand Gen 2 Core i5 for much the same money. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed this particular comparison. That's all we've got for you right now. Press the like button if you enjoyed the video, dislike if you didn't, or leave a comment if you'd like to express yourself more fully. If you want more of the same style of content, go ahead and subscribe. That's all for now, thanks for watching.